Welcome to our Akola Chocola Chocolate Masters Hangout, where we'll be talking about chocolate pop-up shops. My name is Alicia Krupp from Akola Chocola, and today we welcome Amy Jo Padone of Valenza Chocolatier. And we were supposed to have Romeo Garcia of Romeo Chocolates, but unfortunately he's having some technical difficulties um, joining us on the Hangout, so we're hoping that he'll be able to join us a little bit later, but for now, um, Amy, Joe, and I will carry on. So we're really excited to be kicking off our first Chocolate Masters Hangout of 2016 with a topic that's a little bit different from some of the others that we've had in the past. Uh, this is one of the Hangouts where we'll be um, talking about the business side of chocolate for the first time. So um, just before the holidays, we wrote a post for our blog, Bean to Bon Bon, about using pop-up shops as a retail strategy for selling chocolate. And we're so fortunate that Amy, Joe, and Romeo um, told us the stories of their businesses and shared their experiences of using pop-up shops to sell their products, and also their tips for making a pop-up shop successful. So both Amy, Joe, and Romeo told us that people had reached out to them after this blog post to ask more questions, and so we thought a hangout was the perfect opportunity to hear more about this topic. So for anyone who may not be familiar with the term, um, a pop-up shop is essentially just a temporary retail location. Uh, many businesses have implemented pop-up shops as a retail strategy. Um, it can be anything from a table in an existing shop, to um, a kiosk or a cart in a you know, mall, for example, or temporarily taking over um, an existing brick and mortar location. You may have seen you know, big retailers sometimes do big splashy pop-ups um, right before a holiday season. Um, and so for many businesses, a pop-up shop is really an appealing retail strategy because it provides you an opportunity to sell your product in a retail setting without the large setup and overhead costs of a brick and mortar location. But there are specific strategies that can really help to make your pop-up shop a success. And so we're so fortunate to have Amy, Joe, and hopefully Romeo eventually here to share their expertise with us. So let's get to our conversation. So Amy, Joe, could you just tell us a little bit about Valenza Chocolatier, what you did before chocolate, how you got started, and how you currently sell your products? Yeah, yeah. so well, first off, thanks for having me. I I think this is my second actual hangout um, participating, so I just enjoy it. So, um, yeah, so I'll kind of start um, a little bit prior and then I'll lead to what I'm doing today. So, um, I was in commercial real estate lending for about 14 years and, um, you know, had a very successful career um, and was going through a personal, you know, family thing with my cousin. She had ovarian cancer and um, going through her fight um, really left me with this you know, position of like, you know, we only have one life, you know, you can't live with regret. And um, she had, she did pass. And I think her gift, honestly, to me was those questions. And it left me with, you know, sure, I love my job, but I'm putting so much into it and I'm not getting what I want out of. So if I had to do it all over again, what would I do? And so my mom did turtles and chocolate covered cherries and stuff for the holidays and then on my Sicilian side, so Valenza is my maiden name, so that's the tie-in for my company. Um, my grandmother, we always did the Sicilian cookies for Christmas, they were bakers and entrepreneurs, etc. And so I was like, how do I kind of put these two passions together? And I, so I was like, but wait, how do you become a chocolatier? I'm like, I want to go to pastry school, like the, all the questions start going on. So that's when I found um, the program. So I completed my um, professional certificate in 2011, and then 2012 was more of like I did the business plan class. Um, I, you know, it was really kind of developing my brand. So knowing I had these two niches, I um, created Valenza Chocolatier, which is um, Italian-inspired artisan chocolates and confections. Everything has an Italian ingredient or their old family recipes that I've converted to different ganache flavors. Um, I don't use any additives or preservatives, so everything is made to order. And I knew that I wanted to do um, an online business at first. 
and then move into, you know, hopefully one day actually having my own bricks and mortar. So I launched my business in 2000, in the beginning of 2013. I did go to Italy to complete the master's program, um, since obviously that tied right into my branding. And um, so I did that in September of 2013. And so I'm just coming up to my three-year anniversary of launching uh, Valenza Chocolatier. So I'm still an online business. Um, however, I have utilized the pop-up strategy as I've grown and, and the exposure of my business. So um, I was really happy that you guys had reached out to me about this topic because I've definitely had a strategy with it. I've had major lessons learned that I'm very happy to share with people. And um, I think it's just a really good way to gap that position between you know your costs because you don't have to go out right away and have a bricks and mortars because you first right. have to figure out if you have a product that people are actually going to buy. Right. So can you maybe just explain for people kind of how, because people may not know your backstory in terms of how your business has changed because initially you did more pop-ups and then now that you're in your commercial kitchen space, your, your kind of um, retail strategy is a little bit different. So can you maybe yeah. just explain that so people have that background too? Yeah. Yeah, well, I did start right out in a, in a certified um, commercial kitchen. I'm actually in California for anyone out there um, who, you know, is in the states and understands California law. Every, obviously, every state is different in country. Uh, oh, I think we have Romeo. Yay! <laughs> um, Romeo. <laughs> so, uh, so for me, I did start in a commercial kitchen, and what I did was I originally had – um, a launch event. Um, do you want me to talk about that a little bit now? Uh, why don't we wait till we get to that question? Okay. Yeah. So um, I, yeah. So I so I basically used other retail venues um, to ho to have my pop up shops. Um, at the time, William Sonoma was doing an artisan market in a couple of their locations. Actually, it was out throughout the U.S. They had a program, um, yeah. so I had started in those and and just really strategically picked my platform to start growing and then getting exposure to my business. And then yeah. when I got to a level where I had enough following to step, grow even more, that's when I brought the pop-up shops in-house. So I actually do them at my kitchen. And honestly, right. people love coming there because they love to see where it's made. But I couldn't have started off like that because nobody knew who I was. Hey, Romeo. Hi, hey. Romeo. No, I never <laughs> Good, how are you? I'm doing well. Sorry for the delay. There are some technical difficulties, but we got to figure it out. So I'm glad That's to be able to. Okay. No problem. And it's perfect timing because this is my question for you. <laughs> um, so Amy Jo was just telling us a little bit of her backstory about her business. So can you just tell us a bit about yours and what you did before chocolate and how you got started and how you currently sell your products? Sure. So we started Romeo Chocolates. Well, originally before I was a chocolatier, I was actually in higher education and I was doing that for about 14, 15 years. And so I built a career in nonprofit community organizing and higher education management. And I worked my way up very slowly to be a director and a dean. And I was, I think, on a fast track to become a vice president of a college, which yeah. I absolutely love and adore. But for anyone who knows administrators in colleges, it's easily a 60 to 70 hour work week. And I needed something to relax. So on Sundays, I would go to a chocolate making class in San Francisco. And I just fell in love with it. I enjoyed it so much. And I felt like, and Amy Jo could probably uh, attest to this, it's so meditative, like watching chocolates, like just working with it, tempering it, and it's just a fun medium. And so I really enjoyed it. And so I stuck with it for six years. And then I just told myself, you know, I love education, but I'm finding that I'm developing another passion. And I didn't want to wait till I retired. I wanted to travel to Belgium right then and there. <laughs> <laughs> So with that said, I told myself, you know, I'm going to commit to this. And I really want to make sure that I study and, and really be disciplined about learning about chocolates. So I flew myself to Belgium, um, and I studied with uh, Ecole Chocolat, and then with Pam Williams, I just learned as much as I possibly could. And that's what really galvanized in me that this is the next direction that I want to go. And so with that said, Romeo Chocolates, we founded it in November 2014 in Long Beach, California. It's such a fun, fun city. It's very supportive of micro enterprise. It's very supportive of a small business. Currently how I sell is I sell to retail partners. And so I don't have um, a storefront right now. And so no brick and mortar quite yet. So with the 10 to 15 partners that we have, 
they uh, sell our products and I wholesale it to them and they carry it. Uh, my other uh, line that I do is I do pop-ups just like Amy Doe and I'm in front of different storefronts, retail storefronts, restaurants, and we sell our products there. And then lastly, the next transition that we're moving into is because we partner so much with the local wine bars, we're now doing chocolate and wine pairings. And it's such a blast. And so that's the next direction that we're going with our company. Right. That's great. Thanks so much for giving us that overview. We're so proud that both of you are a Cole Chocolat grads. It's so exciting for us to see. Well, thank you very much. It's so it's so exciting for us to see you, you know, you take what you've learned from us and then, you know, grow and do your own thing and it's it's so exciting. Um so let's just talk a little bit more about pop ups since that's why we're here. Um, Amy Jo, what made you decide that pop ups were a good retail strategy for your business? Uh, well, because I didn't have a bricks and mortar. <laughs> I was kind of like, oh, well, how am I going to do this and actually yeah. get my name out there? Um, yeah. and actually, I actually fell a little bit on it by default. Um, <laughs> I, I knew, you know, I, I had a kind of, you know, my bucket strategy and my business plan, um, but I never, I mean, I'd never been in a consumer product, you know, sales, you know, consumer food business. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the originally doing the William Sonoma, um, their market really was very eye opening to me because I was like, you know, when you get to see that face to face reaction with your customers uh, or with p potential customers, and to see their reaction, especially when you're just starting out, um, it almost validates what you're doing. Because it's not, you know, yes, you're looking at the sales and this and that, but it's really, I, I wanted to give them that moment of like when they taste you what you've made out of pure joy, you're giving them that that moment of satisfaction that takes away everything else that's going on in their life. And mm -hmm. when I started doing the pop-ups there, I, I was getting that, and I never had experienced that. And so I was like, well, wait a minute. And then you get, they want to know your story. They want to know, like, well, how did you get into this? They start, you know, it's like all of a sudden they start asking all these questions because they've never really met a chocolatier. And, you know, so it's like just, right. it started feeding into it. Right. And so, so it was kind of like that light bulb moment of, okay, wait a minute. And I wanted to, you know, like Romeo, um, you know, get into some wholesale opportunities. So when right. you're going into the wholesale opportunities, clearly you have you're going to be there to do tastings. Um, right. um, but then it was like, well, wait, you know, they wanted to sell more, and I'm like, well, here I am again. I see the reactions. Then I was like, well, wait, I I don't want to go into other food companies. Maybe I want to go into a jewelry store. You know, so it started like evolving this strategy of specifically you know, picking partners, and we'll get into that a little bit about how to do that, um, yeah. but it was really, people want to know who made these products. Right. They want to see you. They want to hear you talking about it. They want to see your passion, because what happens is, is that they turn around and gift it, and they're telling your story. Right. And then they're getting, so it's like bunnies, and it just like yeah. keeps, you know, multiplying, and, yeah. and they're spreading your message, you know, right. and you're, you're, the taste of the product will then speak for themselves. But right. I knew it, it was that pop-up, that pop-up shops gave me the opportunity to have that face-to-face -face interaction at basically a no cost. I mean, it was my right. time and goodwill, but they, you need to get out from behind your website, and right. that was the way to do it. At least right. for you know what I've thought, and I think Romeo will probably talk about that too. Right. And so now you're able to hold your pop-up shops in the same location as your commercial kitchen. You work out of the Hood Marketplace. Um, but before you did that, um, what types of locations did you choose for your pop-ups, and why? I know we've talked before about how you decided, you know, not farmers markets, for example. So mm -hmm. yeah. um, can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, and that's a good point. You know, first and foremost. You, you really need to identify your brand, and you have to be solid in your brand. What, who is your cus target customer? Um, you know, based on your price points of your product. Um, from there, it's determining. You know, are you a farmers market candidate? You know, is that type of customer and that type of environment 
fit with your brand. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm a little, I'm a higher end, you know, chocolate. Um, and so for me, farmers markets, I didn't feel that, you know, it was a fit. Um, and I also kind of give, <laughs> and then there's, you know, all these retailers and they want you to come in because, you know, you're bringing in customers and then ultimately they think they're going to get, you know, they're going to buy their product too. Um, yeah. But you really have to be careful in the strategy, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, I first and foremost started off with a media event. Yeah. And then from there, that got my name out there so that when I went and approached, for example, Kendra Scott is a, is a jewelry um, store, and I approached them to be like, okay, hey, for Valentine's Day, let's do a one-stop shop. So right. you're going to bring in a florist, you're going to have a chocolate, and now you have the jewelry. So it's a one-stop right. environment. Um, so I strategically picked based on the quality of the vendor to match my brand. You right. know, you're not going to take a Maserati or Ferrari and sell it at a Kia dealership. You know, like right. you, ha you don't want to diminish your brand, and you really have to stay focused on that. Right. You know? So, and you mentioned the media event. Can you tell us a little bit about that and yeah. the results that you saw from doing that? Yeah, so, so again, new product, um, new to the market, new business. It was the best, it was like the best thing I ever did. And I can't, like in hindsight, I was like, man, I was kind of like genius. I'm thinking, <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing, but. Um, of course you were, me, Joe. I strategically picked my, um, <laughs> my food photographer. Um, she uh, was known in the area, um, only does food. I had her do my photos. Mm -hmm. She, by her social media, our, you know, photo shoot, all of the people that follow her in the print and media and PR, they all were like, who's this person? Right. She then helped me say, okay, you, we went through the list of all the food bloggers, all the, you know, the um, media as far as print, um, radio, like Orange County has its own little food, you know, every little, every city has it. I personally invited all of them to a media event. Mm -hmm. I had a uh, at the hood. So, and that was the other thing, like the kitchen was also new, so it kind of helped because there was buzz about the kitchen. Um, I had a, my product line, they could sample, I had a presentation, I was part of the Costa Mesa Chamber of Commerce, they came and did a ribbon cutting, I mean, I treated it as a very formal opening of a business. Um, they left with a media guide, they left with a goodie bag, and right then I was on all of their radar. So then what's happened now over the last three years is obviously I've gotten, you know, a lot of, um, you know, features obviously throughout these things. But when it comes to my pop-up shops, I can email them or my publicist who I have now, but I didn't for the first year and a half. You know, we can email them and say, here are the, all the pop-ups. They put it on their calendars. The bloggers blog about it. It'll get in the print. You know, so I, and that's all free. Right. I'm not paying for any advertising. So that media event helped me get buzzed because, yes, we're going to use social media to promote, but because they had physically tasted my product and heard my passion, they want to support. And I, I guarantee that's probably the same in every market. Yeah. That's, that was a really great strategy. It seems like you got a, you built a lot of relationships through that yeah, as well. Yeah, and they see yeah. the consistency. That's the other thing because you don't, you know, seeing the consistency year after year because we know how hard this business is and we know, you know, unfortunately the rate of, you know, the business staying, you know, viable is, you know, not very high. Um, yeah. So they want to help and they really want to pay it forward. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about promotion. So how do you typically promote your pop-ups, and how do you have to change your promotion strategy over time? Um, yeah, let me, I'm just kind of making sure that I'm like, <laughs> I want to make sure I keep it. So, um, so, of course, I said, you know, we go through the aspect of the, 
of um, the media, you know, our local, I have a local list that I send out to. Um, yeah. And this you could do, I do it in my, in my kitchen, but you can do it as well as um, any other vendor. Um, maybe two weeks before the event, go to Staples. They make these high glossy poster boards, have an amazing high definition graphic, Make it, you know, and then lay over, you know, pop-up shop, your name, when, where, and put that in your location of where you're mm -hmm. going to have it so that their customer, you know, starts seeing it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when the vendor that you're choosing, you give that graphic electronically, you give them the message of what they want to promote because you don't want them, you know, changing your, you know, content per se. So they're going to do your social media, you know, so you really come up with a PR strategy of how you're going to promote it via yeah. social media, your own direct mailer, I use MailChimp, um, you know, getting a physical sign at the place, you know, at least two weeks prior. You, mm -hmm. you really don't need it more than two weeks because people are, you know, not that great. I mean, it's like, you know, <laughs> people aren't like a month ahead. You're like, okay, you know, right. it's really not like that. Um, yeah. um, and then the other thing is, is because I'm primarily an online business, um, what I do is I don't start promoting the pop-ups until after, so for example, we're in holiday time. So yeah. Christmas, I had an online ordering deadline. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, I want them to go through my website and order a pre-order. Um, but people are going to miss that. But I don't want to give them the heads up like, hey, I'm having a pop-up shop, you know, because then they're not going to go order online. And in the event that you have to give a percentage cut to, you know, the place that you're selling out of, now you've just, you know, taken that profit and placed it to them. So I don't specifically start promoting it until after my deadline. And then, and which is usually going to be about a week or two, you know, before the actual event. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a, a just, um, but have high resolution photos, a very professional um, graphic put together. You, you can use, I use, I do it all myself. I don't hire a graphic designer. Um, you can use, I use Pixel Needle, Pixel Needle on Apple if you have photo, um, shop, whatever. Um, but make sure those graphics and what you're putting out there is consistent with your brand. Yeah, okay. So what are some of the most important lessons you've learned about planning for your pop-ups mm -hmm. that determine whether or not they'll be successful? Um, well, I think your location. So picking your vendor, and I'm sure Romeo will discuss this with you too. You know, again, make sure that you have the same collaboration as far as, you know, their brand and your brand are a fit together, um, their customer bases, uh, because, you know, if you know the price point, you know what who, what the type of customers are, make sure to ask them. Um, yeah. So the collaboration between you and the vendor is crucial. Uh, you need to make sure that you set up front, you know, is this, are you giving them a percentage of your sales? You know, is this your way of selling wholesale there? Um, get all of that up front. How is the sale going to be rung up? Are they going to ring it up? Um, through their system, or are you going to have your own POS and use Square, et cetera? Are you going to do the packaging? Are they going to package it up? Um, mm -hmm. You know, do they have tissue, bags? I mean, it's all, you want that sale experience when they come in to be so seamless. So you have to make sure that that vendor understands your products, they're in the system, they're the right prices, you have an inventory sheet so you can keep track of what's going on. Because, if you, again, you've got that small opportunity to get them to get that sale and then out nine times out of ten they're going to be a repeat customer yeah so make sure that is that is seamless um, a, a good lesson learned is um, the cancellation um, again this goes back to picking your quality of your vendor um, I've had a few vendors cancel on last minute and it it, it was by no means it was their lack of um, taking it serious and mm -hmm. What happens is that that's a reflection of me because I've already promoted the event and then people show up and they think I know show. So you really need to be careful of who you pick and the relationship that you build because you know they can cancel. And the other thing that can happen is like all of a sudden customers are coming and only buying your product and they're not benefiting from having you there. 
Yeah. So how you handle that, you know, is very, you know, is is a interesting, you know, dance, I should say. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you've done a great job of touching on some of the advantages and disadvantages kind of as we've been talking, and I want to bring Romeo in. So, um, Romeo, let's um, hear more about your approach and what made you decide that pop-ups were a good retail strategy for your business. Uh, I think the reason why I decided to do pop-up is because I knew ultimately my goal was to really emulate the experience that we had in Belgium and Italy I just had such a great time visiting these boutique chocolate shops and I wanted to bring that, that very visceral feeling to Southern California. I really wanted people to experience that. We don't have that quite yet in downtown Long Beach. However, I knew that I needed to ramp up in order to even get to that brick and mortar. And so I needed to crawl before I can walk, before I can run. And the pop-up shop just made perfect sense for me so that way I could be very um, protracted in building up this company. A lot of it too is I'm pop-up shops because I'm a cottage food bee industry and so for folks who are in California that might be familiar with that I don't know what other states call it but cottage food bee essentially allows you to partner with the health department and they inspect your home production and you could do certain approved recipes certain approved uh, inclusion bars certain approved ganaches and where they check your, your sugar ratio so you have to work with your particular state for that approval so with that it allowed me to do some products but they had to be wrapped everything has to be packaged and labeled as such and so with that, it actually limited me in terms of like my product offerings, but it was able to get me into the retail shops for so at least they could sell some of the packaged items that we had. And that made sense for me at the time being. A lot of times too is like I really want to make sure that while I'm doing pop-ups, I'm simultaneously working on different embers. And what I mean by that, I'm doing pop-up shops, I'm also just meeting people. I'm talking mm -hmm. to them, I'm getting them like as what Amy Joe is saying, like getting them excited about the story. And a lot of times I just want to tell them about my journey. <laughs> and I just want to tell them how much fun I have like doing this industry. I'm not going to lie. And Amy Joe can probably test this. There's times we're making coffee. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. But it's a different type of stress. For me, it's just it's something very uh, meditative. It's something very peaceful for me. And I love sharing that story with folks. As we go to the fine chocolate industry, as we work with the cold chocolate, we learn about all these single origins and all these amazing chocolate flavors that are coming through. I have officially decided I'm a chocolate geek now. <laughs> and I really like sharing, sharing with other folks, like all these amazing flavors of chocolate too. It's just like the craft coffee industry that's really taken off. It's just like wine. It's just like all these craft beer companies that are taken off. This craft chocolate awareness is already there in the consciousness of our consumers. We're just providing that information to them. Right. And uh, for pop-up shops, I think it just makes sense for now because as a micro business, we have to keep overhead low. You know, we don't have the resources to pay utilities, to pay rent, you know, to pay a, a enormous staff. And so we have to make sure that we scale up very carefully. And so that's why I feel like that strategy works for me for now. Right. So where do you typically hold your pop-up shops and why? And do you choose different locations depending on the time of year and or maybe a holiday season? Usually the pop-up shops that I select are places that I love because I'm a consumer of their brand too. And so a lot of times when we cross promote, especially in the Long Beach area, I'm just a big fan of the local makers and the small businesses that are there too, whether it's a retailer or whether it's a restaurant. So first and foremost, I'm a retailer and I'm a big fan of theirs. And so we find a way to collaborate because what we normally do is we look at the micro villages and neighborhoods that we have in Long Beach. So whether it be Belmont Shores near the water or Bixby Knolls, which is a little bit more upland, Every single village has its own first Fridays or second Saturdays or some sort of art walk. And so we partner with them knowing that there's going to be a significant amount of foot traffic there as well too. And so that's how we strategize which pop-ups we're going to do as well too. And there has to be, like what Amy Jo says, some degree of brand alignment. And so you want to pick retailers that match what you're doing with your, with your brand. And so in terms of like... Um, accessible luxury retail. So that's what we try to partner with in terms of Long Beach is finding that accessible price point. So if they're clothing or if they're jewelry or if the restaurant um, entrees and wine is part is priced as such, I try to figure out okay where does my price point match with that and are we in brand alignment with our product. And so that's right. normally how we pick our retailers as well too. Right. And how do you typically promote your pop-up shops um, and has your promotion strategy changed over time at all? Uh, it's changed a little bit. I mean, one of the, the struggles that I have is I'm an in-betweener generation. I'm not a millennial. I don't totally get Instagram. I don't totally get... <laughs> Come on, I'm older than you, Romeo. I really do. And I used to 
movie a lot because people are so visual, you know? And so Amy and Joe would say, you have to get that perfect graphic. You just want to make sure that you entice people in. You want them to eat your Instagram feed, essentially. So yeah. <laughs> use Instagram a lot so that way people can get excited about your, your product. And then you can put the details in terms of where you're popping up uh, as well, too. Yeah. We use our website seasonally. And so as I have more pop-ups coming up, like right now we're doing a website refresh, so we'll put on our March and our April dates. And so you'll see our pop-up locations, our chocolate and wine pairing events, and, and things as such. Um, so those are some of my avenues that I use. A lot of it, too, as Amy, Joe, and I are building more of a, of a following uh, within our certain regions, people tell other people where we're going to pop up. And so in our retailers, and this is why it's so important to build that relationship with your retailers, your retailers will tell you when they're going to show up at their shop again. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of people uh, being your spokespeople for your brand as well, too. And that works out very nicely as well. Um, and then lastly, I think it's just really important to have a consistent uh, communication stream through your newsletter. So I think, Amy Jo, you were mentioning uh, MailChimp. Mm -hmm. I, I, use that as, I use that as well, too, to send um, big seasonal information to, uh, to our chocolate uh, uh, customers. Um, but what I also do too is like I put on their promotional codes, promo codes that they can use so that way it really encourages them to be part of the newsletter community. Right. That's a good tip too, the promo code. That's a good, that's a good tip. What are some of the um, advantages and disadvantages about using pop-up shops to sell your products? I think um, some of the advantages that I would say is that uh, there's truly that's happening with the companies in, in Long Beach or whoever I partner with. There's a cross promotion of brands, and I think that very authentic collaboration is really important. At the end of the day, you know, business aside, these are your friends, and you want to make sure that their business is doing well, and they're really in good faith trying to make sure that your top of business is doing well too. Right. Um, so I love that advantage of working together. Um, I also think there's moderate risks. I was mentioning there's low overhead, you know, there's low staffing, and so that's very helpful as a pop up as well too. Another advantage is you have visibility in different markets of your neighborhood, of your town, of your city, and you can explore as you're working towards your brick and mortar, where do you foresee yourself? You know, where do you see this chocolate brand happening? Are you getting enough foot traffic in that area? Are you getting that, that, that clientele that you're hoping for in that area as well? Too? And so those are some of the advantages. And were you asking me about disadvantages, Alicia? Yeah, or challenges, if you don't want to say <laughs> Okay, let's talk about some working challenges. I don't really think yeah. any disadvantages. I think I'm too <laughs> I'm really an optimist. Some, yeah. of the, some of the working challenges, I would say, is that sometimes it's hit or miss. I mean, you plan and plan and plan, and you prepare maybe, I don't know, 200 items that you hope to sell that day, and you might sell two bars or something like that. And there's days right. where I feel like, wow, I really feel like a chocolate company like I saw in Belgium or like I saw in Italy. I feel like we're at that place where we're actually building a full enterprise. And there's other days I feel like I'm pulling a wagon trying to sell cookies. <laughs> Not in day. <laughs> I think if you, know, you never know like what your consumer base is going to be like on that given pop-up. And so right. some of the advantages is just you just have to prepare. You know, but even though on the days that we're not able to sell as much, I always see it as an opportunity that I can have an engaging conversation with someone. Mm -hmm. That particular day didn't necessarily lead to sales. It led to some sort of interaction, some sort of transaction with someone that says, hey, I believe in your product, and I'm going to revisit this with you someday. And sure enough, it led, it, it led to another potential pop-up, or it led to a custom order, or it led to something that allowed to progress your brand. And so I never see things as a, as a, as a disadvantage. I always see things as a challenge that you could really transform into an opportunity. Right. That's a very good attitude. Oh, that's, that's important. I think you have to have <laughs> an attitude as a pop-up chocolatier. It helps you survive. <laughs> well, no, just the, the joy that you have, both of you, it just, it just comes through the joy that you have for your businesses, and that's just you. so wonderful to see. Mm -hmm. um, so the next couple of questions are for both of you, um, but Romeo, why don't you answer first? So you just had your Valentine's Day pop-up shops. So how did they go, and did you learn any new tips? I think what I learned from the Valentine's season is that you don't prepare in February. <laughs> you prepare really in advance. And so, you. <laughs> and so I learned that from last 2015. And so this 2016, I learned that I actually needed to prepare come September or October. So September, October, I would line up. There's two battles in, in chocolates. One is to get your recipe situated for the next four months. 
um, but also to get your packaging situated because you got to get your vendors to ship you your packages for things like that. So what I learned about this Valentine's season was that I had to prepare last year, which I did. And so when I got the shipments in on my Valentine's boxes and I knew which confections I wanted to do, then I was able to update my website and project that as, as well. Um, me, Joe was mentioning, your images and your graphics really need to compel and really need to tell the story about your brand. Um, your brand um, overall, but your brand for that season. And so what we did, for instance, for Valentine's is I'm starting to wrap my collections around a, a campaign or a theme. So our theme around Valentine's season was called Embrace. And it was trying to find a word that had to do with love without it being blatantly about love. And so it could be about embracing love, embracing your partner. It could also be about embracing opportunity, embracing family, embracing indulgence. It could be about anything. And that allowed us to create such a cool collection uh, and packaging around our chocolates as well, too. And so our Valentine's season, I think, really went well. I actually learned this from uh, Amy Jo. I learned to give people definitive deadlines. So retailers letting them know, hey, if you want to partner with me, I absolutely want to partner with you too, which we have to know by January 31st what you're interested in ordering. So I can prepare in advance your batch, you know, because it's not like this is coming through a conveyor belt. These are micro batches that we have to create for them. And then right. sec secondly, for your consumers as well, letting them know where can they find your product. And I did do a test run of deliveries because at Scottish Food B, you're allowed to do hand deliveries as well. So we did do a test run on my website so that way they could order online as well. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the lessons that I learned from Valentine's. And leading into um, spring, we'll probably do another collection um, in the next three or four months. So my takeaway is that don't prepare that month. Prepare about three or four months ahead of time of the season. So that way you've already forecasted what's going to happen um, right. when the season approaches. Right. And Amy Jo, how about you? How is Valentine's Day? Any new tips? Good. Well, um, I just want to kind of add on to what Romeo said. Um, you know, because I do now work with a publicist, um, you know, I actually do my whole Christmas, Valentine's, Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day, like in May and June of the prior year. So, because then uh, what I do is then I send press releases out. So, in the event that I get a hit, because all of your print is usually about three to four months before the actual holiday are their deadlines. So, if you're thinking about getting bigger in your promotion, you just kind of kind of keep working back, you know, when you have your collections ready and, and defined and the photos, et cetera. Um, so, just to add to, to Romeo's um, takeaway there. Um, another thing is um, have an email sign up sheet at every pop up. Because the goal is to get their email so you can add that into your database for your newsletter. Because then you've got that direct hit on them. I do it with a raffle. So sign up and you're going to win this box of chocolate, you know, and bang, I get their email addresses, you know. So there's ways to get creative, but that email is really gold to you um, and, and you want to get that. Um, Valentine's Day for me this year, um, I did something that, you know, it's kind of the same processes as I did last year. However, so we all get the calls from Yelp, guys, the Yelp people wanting to sell you advertisements, you know, this, that, the other thing. And so the guy from Yelp, um, he keep, kept calling me, and I was like, yeah, 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 call me tomorrow. Or I just kept putting him up. So finally I listened to him. And he was like, you know, have you ever done a Yelp ad? And I'm like, well, I'm not a bricks and mortar. I'm like, my problem with Yelp is I get calls and they, where's your store? And then I say, it, you know, because they don't go to the website. So he's like, have you ever really done a Yelp ad? And you, and I'm like, no. And, and I'm, and I was like, well, how much is it? That's always my first question. And he's like, well, you set when the ad starts and when the ad ends. And then it's based on how many clicks, et cetera, the price. And I'm like, you mean, so it's not like a month, you know, I'm thinking like every month I, they're deducting $9.99 out of my, you know, bank account. like I don't know the, and he's like, no. So I had, I had a total bias to it. It literally was the best thing that I did for Valentine's Day. Because the first thing men are, or women or anybody's going to do when they want to buy for their partner, they're Googling chocolate, Orange County, best chocolate, you know, to pull that up. And that ad puts you right at the top. Right. So my first cuss, so I did a three-day pop-up shop in my kitchen. The first person that walked in, I said, how did you hear about it? He's like, Yelp. 
of where my customers 20% were Yelp the mm -hmm. first time never met day two 90% of my customers were all Yelp never met them before <laughs> okay and the same yeah. for the next day. I mean the ad paid itself and then some so my 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 feedback is when you do, it's hard, I think it would be hard to do a Yelp ad on just like a normal pop-up non-holiday, but for Valentine's Day, when that is the number one gift that people are gifting, mm -hmm. that you utilize it. Because the other thing it does is Yelp has the highest um, SEO for Google. So it's a double whammy. So if they just Google chocolate, best chocolate, or, you know, and put the city, it not only, you're going to pop up in Yelp as well. Like right. the Yelp ad will pop up. So you'll get the search from Yelp right away, or you'll get it from Google, which will then tie to the Yelp and be the first one, the hit. Yeah. So I was just like, oh my gosh, I want to tell everybody. <laughs> like, why didn't anybody tell me this? Like, well, now you have. That's so, great. Like, you know, a $43 investment turned, it was like, you know, had like a 3,000% return or, you know, I mean, it was ridiculous how well. Yeah. And it was like, why didn't, I mean, it just makes sense. So, but again, I think you really have to tie it to, you know, of course I knew that's what people would be doing. They're going to be Googling chocolate. Right. Um, you know, Christmas, I don't know as much. I'll be curious to see. But, I mean, clearly for a Valentine's Day, I, I highly recommend it. Right. That's a great tip. Yeah. Um, so your next pop-up shops will be around Easter. Um, what are you guys planning for those? Anything different that you do depending on the holiday? Or, Romeo, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, so I think for the next collection, we're not – necessarily thematically doing it around Easter, we're doing it around the concept of spring. And so okay. we're go for like lighter flavors and bringing more exotic uh, tropical flavors as well too. And so what I like to do with our chocolates as well is I like to inform it with where I travel. And so I was able to visit North Shore Hawaii and see the cacao farms over there with one of our partners in FCIA. And yeah. I had such a good time. And then so bringing in that chocolates and bringing in tropical flavors that complement and enhance the flavors of that chocolate, I'm really excited about. Things like lilikoi or passion fruit, things like macadamia, um, things like I, I just have some exciting tropical flavors that I want to bring in as a spring collection, not necessarily for Easter per se. I did try to do an Easter chocolate event. I don't know if Amy Jo had a similar situation with her pop-ups, but people were busy on Easter. They weren't there to shop for chocolates at the pop-ups, and if they were, I think they were looking for something that's more of a novelty for kids. Um, right. But I don't know, maybe other chocolatiers have had a different experience than, than I than I have. But I am thematically wrapping around spring, but I'm also just learning in terms of preparing for seasons way in advance. I'm actually wrapping my mind around the Mother's Day collections. And right. so that's really what I'm working on right now. Right. Great. And Amy Jo, what about you? Easter plans? Uh, yeah, so for Easter, I actually do uh, my pop-up um, Wednesday, Thursday before Easter. So, you know, Good Friday, obviously people have off and people are not going to, the Easter weekend, it, it, it's different, you know, they're, they have plans. Um, where like Valentine's Day, you want to go right up into Valentine's mm -hmm. Day. Um, yes, Easter being a religious holiday, it's a different, um, a different mindset, a different customer base. Um, Romeo is right, you have a more of a children, you know, you know, it, it, does your chocolate fit, you know, for children? Is that something that they would purchase? Um, for me, um, and and studying Italian chocolates, etc. Easter is a very big holiday in Italy, um, you know, for obvious reasons. And each chocolatier is really known by the large eggs that they produce and how they decorate. And the eggs are filled with all different assortments of chocolate, and it's fused together. You break it open. It's a tradition. That was something that we've done in my family for as long as I can remember. So my Easter, my Easter is really built upon family tradition, and that's how I market it. So I have become like 
family tradition, like my chocolates become my customers' family traditions for Easter. So that's kind of how I pitch it. Um, but I do, um, I also I do solid eggs um, in packs, you know, for them that they do purchase for their kids. Um, because, you know, they do want to buy, uh, you know, a more higher end chocolate, you know, less sugar, etc. cetera. Um, but again, my focus for Easter is about family tradition and I do it before Easter. Um, and it's very specific. Um, sales are definitely different than they are for Valentine's and Christmas. Um, however, you know, there is, you know, that there's, I definitely still have a very large market that um, seeks out my Easter stuff. But right. it's all around eggs. You can go on my right. website and it totally makes sense. Um, right. So the same concept of how I'm promoting, et cetera, is the same. It's just the collection itself, like like Romeo was saying, you know, having a purpose for that collection. You know, and for me, I'm choosing the family tradition because of what Easter represents and and doing it that way. Right. Okay, so I just have one last question for both of you. If you had to boil down the keys to a successful pop-up shop to your top three tips, what would they be? And Amy Jo, why don't you answer first this time? <laughs> um, okay, I first, location. I mean, that's kind of like your role, you know, real estate law. Location, location, location. Again, your right location, right retailer that is complementing your brand. Um, be brand aware. It's okay to say no if it's not a right fit for your brand and it's not the right customer base. Um, second, have a PR strategy. When you do something last minute, it actually shows that it was last minute. Have a strategy. Um, <coughs> third is have fun. I mean, we work so hard and, you know, like you said, the late nights, the, the and this is your chance to like let you you know you're like telling your story. They're trying your stuff. You're engaged, and it, you and and that's when you know if it's really your passion and it comes out. And you just have to have fun. If you're not having fun doing it, then it's time to do a, a, your own self check because you know when you're alone working, and then all of a sudden now you got people around and you're just like woo. You know, talking, talking, talking. So, um, so lastly, would be just to have fun with it. Those are excellent tips, Romeo. What about you? Top three. Okay, so I think my top three would be uh, one for folks who want to approach pop-ups, still to be disciplined in terms of figuring out like metrics. How do you know that you have improved month to month by month, and as you get more seasoned in your pop-up shop year to year, until you decide whatever your next goal is, if it's brick and mortar, brick and mortar, and so. Concretely, like what I've been doing is I've been using my POS system. So my POS system is Square, and I could actually see metrics about what are the most popular things that are selling. I could see from last February 2015 that mm -hmm. I've, I've increased it three times this February 2016. Have very concrete metrics so you could be disciplined within yourself to see how much do I want to see it grow every month and be very scientific about that growth for your company. So you could see if you're making the margins that you want to make. Um, secondly, I would say build those relationships with your consumers. Like really engage them, as Amy Jo said, with your story. They're buying your chocolates, but they're also buying your journey. Like they want to be part of it. They want to experience that as well too. And they're living vicariously through our joy, I think. And so like come in there with that optimism to share your story because they want to hear about it, I feel. Um, and you want them to be, when you're ready to build your brick and mortar, they, you want them to feel connected. They, you want them to feel like a co-owner of this vision. And so um, as you ramp up to that, you want to have them uh, feel very connected to that. And lastly, as uh, Amy Jo was saying as well too, you just have to have a positive outlook in this industry and a positive discipline about it. Yes, there are long nights. Yes, there are really tough setups for pop-ups. But at the same time, if you have a positive outlook that you're building or something that you have a strong passion for, it totally makes it worthwhile. So keep that discipline, but keep a positive outlook with that discipline as well too. All right. Well, this has been such a great conversation. I just want to say thank you to Amy Jo Padone of Valenza Chocolatier and Romeo Garcia of Romeo Chocolates. I know we went a little bit longer today, but it was such a great conversation. You gave everyone so much great information, and I just want to say a big thank you for giving of your time today. Um, and if you know anyone who may have missed our live broadcast, we'll be posting the video on our website, www.acolchocolat.com, shortly. And thank you all for watching. Thank you. Get ready. Bye.